I have always been fascinated by the band documentary. Not the frenetic energy of a concert film, or the often hackneyed style of TV documentaries with narration and talking heads, but films that capture the pure thrill of creating music in the moment, showing the audience a glimpse of just how some of the greatest songs of all time were written. As soon as my friend invited me to be a part of her band named Cross-Eyed and Painless after the Talking Heads song, I thought about how I could make something out of the experience. And so, starting from January this year, I've been recording every step of our progress as a band, from performing terrible covers, experimenting with effects, and wondrous moments of creativity. Now, I am proud to present to you Cross-Eyed and Painless, a band documentary. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from Cross-Eyed and Painless. It's Thank you. March. Before we start, let's introduce the band. This is our drummer, Melody. I met her on Twitter, which is kind of extraordinary if you think about it. We met in real life at the screening of the legendary concert film Stop Making Sense at I-Square, which is also where I met Alan, our guitarist, who is a bit of a psychopath, but I love him nonetheless. Finally, we have Noel, our singer, who Melody met at the AIA Carnival. She's really, really great. We have also had several lineup ships over the five months we've been a band, so the full lineup isn't completed until practice number four. But without further ado, let's begin our journey. Day one was messy. At this point, I had barely met any member of the band more than a handful of times, and I had not even met our first bassist, Harrison. Melody was late by two hours, so our multi-instrumentalist, Ryan, had to substitute on drums for most of the session. At this point, I was completely new to the idea of being in a band, so we spent a few hours playing some really bad covers of songs that we only knew vaguely. So here is a terrible cover of Weezer's Buddy Holly, where I tried to experiment with a weird camera angle. Yeah, so not great. It wasn't until we randomly decided to do some jamming, pretty much just improvisation, that we really started to get in the groove of things. We had worked out a decent jangle pop progression and actually wrote some really nice licks and melodic lines. But we didn't really go back and explore those ideas further. But I think it was here that Alan and I would really start to understand each other as musicians and begin building what we were playing off of each other. You can see it in this clip, when Alan and I start to solo differently, but end up converging on a single, melodic idea. This sort of telepathic understanding would develop greatly as we would continue writing songs in the future. Finally, Melody arrived, though it was too late to get anything meaningful done, so we just ended up playing a manic, distorted cover of Talking Heads' Psycho Killer, which was awesome and really made me realize how exciting performing music actually is. Day two at least saw everybody show up on time, thankfully. The main goal this day was to perfect the shoegaze-style cover of Radiohead's True Love Waits, which ended up sounding really great. This was the first time that everybody knew what part they were supposed to play, and the band finally seemed to have some sort of a direction. We also screwed around a lot, spontaneously jumping into a cover of Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit, which was actually pretty good. Yay! This day also involves some impromptu songwriting and improv, with us coming up with two very different sounding songs. The first was a very heavenly sounding jangle, backed with angelic and harmonic backing vocals. The second, and much more unhinged song, 
was a random noise rock cacophony, which involved me putting a screeching, chaotic solo over Alan's crazy shouting. I actually really loved it, but we ended up cutting it because, well... <laughs> Day 2 saw the band really getting to grips with performing together, and the first time we really sounded like a band. Day 3 saw several significant changes. Harrison left the band because of time and also because he just wasn't that good. Sorry Harrison. We also saw Noel join the band, immediately giving us a vocalist who could actually sing. The focus was still True Love Waits, which we frankly nailed, but we also branched out and worked on original material, whilst also spontaneously bursting into several horrendous Britpop covers. This day was pretty bad in terms of songwriting, but we did manage to come up with an interesting Midwest emo-inspired riff. This wouldn't really develop into anything though. The most impactful moment of the day occurred at the end, when Ryan provided us with some earth-shattering news. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm quite What? what? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, it's, it's hilarious. What? You're quitting? You're leaving me. No. <laughs> yeah. You're leaving me. Yeah. Just don't leave. Just don't leave. Truly heartbreaking. And with that, the finalized lineup of cross Night and Painless will be created. Unfortunately, having four people show up every Saturday proved to be much more difficult than I had previously expected. The next two sessions proved to be very unproductive. However, I didn't say that we didn't have a really good time. Noah was busy because of exams, so we went to a trio for days 4 and 5, with me converting to the bass. The most significant moment of these sessions was probably a post-punk slash cold wave song that I supplemented with random effects from Ryan's pedal board. The build of the song combined with the aggressive fuzz of the bass actually made the song pretty good, and we didn't completely eliminate it from our set list until we realized that the sound of the song really did not mesh with the sound we were looking for. <laughs> This session also included one of the best jams we have ever had, which saw us completely develop a hard rock inspired jam in wonderful fashion. I wish I could show you all of it because the telepathic connection the three of us have developed as musicians is really astounding. We also tried in vain to write an assortment of new songs, none of them being that interesting. I tried a high bass riff in one of our sessions that didn't go anywhere, and our attempt at making something funky left a lot to be desired. We also did a bunch of terrible covers, but that should be par for the course by now. However, in the midst of those terrible covers, one particularly awful one stands out. We realized that Creep by Radiohead and All I Want for Christmas is You were in the same key and had the same chord progression, so we decided to commit a crime against music. Pretty horrendous. Day 6 saw Noel returning, but further progress was not reached. We put together a pretty good cover of Life During Wartime by Talking Heads. You can tell we all like Talking Heads. But other than that, nothing really seemed to work. We tried to do some extended jamming, the instrumental passages stretching out to almost 16 minutes, but nothing good ever came out of it. It was at this point when we began to have a serious discussion about the future of the band, and how we could continue on with it after I graduated. The future of the band seemed uncertain. My bandmates had other priorities. Alan and Melody were working on a launch gig, and we had to temporarily put things aside to focus on our gig at the Rugby Sevens. We had done six full practice sessions and nothing meaningful had come out of it. However, we would have one more practice before the sevens. Day seven was going to be tiring. We had originally booked the room for five hours because we had to practice for three different bands, but cancellations meant that the practice time went down to about three and a half. However, during the two hours that we did dedicate to Cross-Eyed and Painless, something happened. 
We started writing music that was good. We started off with more talking heads, this time doing a half decent cover of Burning Down the House. But then some moments of random creativity, Alan and I both came up with two riffs. Mine was a slower, post-rock influenced, tense rock song. Whilst Alan's poppy riff was reminiscent of the brightest, funkiest 2000 indie rock. Throughout the session, we would continually work on these two songs, putting lyrics to them and working out the entire structure. By the end of day 7, we had written two relatively complete songs. The euphoria we felt as we started shaping these songs together was unparalleled, and felt like we had actually gone somewhere with the band. Day 8 was a disaster. Noel was out, so we had planned for another friend to come join us as a vocalist, but some emergencies meant that only Alan and I showed up, which led to perhaps the worst practice we've ever had. We ended up just doing acoustic covers and random improvisation for two hours, made especially worse by the fact that we didn't have a drummer. We tried to be a little productive, but 30 minutes of jamming just left us with a half-decent riff. Day 9 saw Noel and Melody return, and had us finally fully fleshing out the songs. Our excitement at achieving this previously unattainable goal of actually writing a good song was palpable, and we were filled with joy over it. We also ended up doing a long improvisation based around the main riff from New Order's Age of Consent, but that also didn't result in anything too interesting. And now, we arrive at the final day. I would like to tell you that the finale of this documentary saw us blaze out with a showing of majestic splendor, but no. Day 10 saw Alan pretty much miss the entirety of the session due to hanging out with a friend for his birthday. No, not the Buddha. Melody, being the very responsible person that she is, showed up two and a half hours late. So for most of the day, it was just me, Noel, and my friend Callie, who didn't know any of the songs. We tried improvising, but it was terrible. None of it came to fruition. Alan popped in to give us some terrible covers, but other than that, it was a poor session. After Melody finally showed up with her boyfriend, we gave them a good strangling and yelled at them for their outrageous tardiness. Near the end of the session, just after I left, Melody asked Noel and I if we wanted the band to continue or to just disband. In the moment, I thought it was an outrageous decision. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the future of the band looked bleak. Noel was busy with exams until the end of June, I am away for most of June, and Alan leaves at the start of July. After day three, I started getting some symptoms of hearing loss, and I fear I have to quit for the good of my own health. When I originally set out to make this documentary, I anticipated a triumphant end, including a farewell performance similar to the Beatles' Get Back, but now many things are up in the air. We experienced several unbelievable highs and quite a few debilitating lows, but being in Cross-Eyed and Painless has been a wonderful experience and journey. Thank you all for watching, and I really hope you enjoyed. Different change of perspective. All right, hi. If you're watching this, if you're one of like three people, if you're one of like three people watching this, and if you actually more to be honest, but this is only gonna get shown to like five people. I watch the. Oh, I watched the room come out. Kill everybody in there. I watched the stars burn out. Pretending that I care.